Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we begin tonight, uh, I copy down a prayer for us, the prayer to St. Joseph, protector of the church. Uh, so I thought we'd start off with that this evening. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Brave St. Joseph, collaborating in God's project for humanity, your tenderness enfolds the newborn church. Just as Mary and Jesus recognized in you the protection of the Father, so too does the community of faith place itself under your protection. Strengthen us with the spirit that filled the Nazarene home, and guide our footsteps on the road to the kingdom. Accompany us in carrying on our mission. Help us to be light in the world, so that the family of God may spring forth from humanity, transfigured in Christ. Grant us the strength to imitate God's preference for the poor and needy. Guide us in our pastoral activities, that our actions may be modeled by good news. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so as I said, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, here we are. Second Sunday of Advent already. Uh, because of the earliness of Christmas, I figured it out, it's only 15 days now until Christmas Eve. <laughs> so we're, we're coming up quick. We're definitely coming up fast. Uh, so I definitely hope that you've got, you're getting all your Christmas preparations together, both spiritual and material. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to continue our series on, on Advent and Faith. Uh, and specifically tonight, we'll be looking at that figure, St. Joseph, uh, and how faith played such an important part in his life, uh, and what he, you know, when he kind of practiced faith, and, and what, you know, what examples we can learn from the, from the very little bit that we know about him uh, that kind of show us his faith. And, and hopefully through looking at this, we can look and we can see, you know, how we can model that how we can imitate St. Joseph in our lives, uh, especially during these last 15 days of Advent leading up to Christmas. Uh, so to begin with, because I know, you know some people weren't here and it's also been uh, a whole week, I just wanted to briefly kind of recap what we talked about last week and mention some of the main themes about faith so we can see those tonight when we talk about Joseph. Uh, first off, we said that the act of faith is the basis of salvation. It's that, that essential act that we have to do uh, in order to be saved. Uh, but then we also said that it's something that's all-encompassing, something that involves our entire lives, our entire existences. Uh, it involves both a, a simple statement, you know, a simple intellectual statement of I believe, but then it also involves our will, our actions and everything as well. So, so it encompasses our entire lives. It's a different understanding than what the Protestants would say about faith. Okay? Uh, faith is also, when we talk about it, it's essentially knowledge of something that we do not see. So it implies a kind of darkness. Uh, whenever we have faith, remember we use that example we never say we, we have faith that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's something that we see for ourselves. Uh, if we only believe in something, we only have faith in something, when we don't see it directly for ourselves. Next, we said that that faith, that belief, is always based on an authority. It's always based on somebody telling us something, right? We believe because we trust someone. Uh, and in the theological act of faith, in religion, that authority is always God. He is the primary authority. He is the one who reveals himself to us. Right? We, don't, we don't just discover God. Man did not just kind of discover everything about God on his own. God reveals who he is to us. All right? And then finally we said that faith is always kind of something imperfect because we can't see and so because we can't see, we always kind of by nature desire to see. We always want to see for ourselves. It's not good enough to kind of take it on somebody else's word. We want to go further. We want to, we want to always see face to face. And so faith is something 
that increases our desire for God himself. The more and more we believe, the more and more we desire to see him face to face, the more and more we trust in him, the more and more faith we have in him. So it's this kind of circular notion where the more and more we believe, that leads to greater belief. Okay, so those were a few of of kind of the things that we talked about with faith. Now, in order to see how that uh, applies to St. Joseph, uh, we're going to kind of break it up into, into two halves tonight. Topic one, or tackle one thing in the first half and another thing in the second half. Uh, in the first half, we're just going to focus on getting to know St. Joseph, uh, kind of what scripture tells us about him, how scripture describes him. Okay, and kind of, yeah, what we, what we can glean from that, from the very little that's there. And then the second half, we'll actually look and we'll see St. Joseph's faith in specific actions he does. Again, we don't know very many of those, but we will study two of them in particular to see how he has faith, okay? Uh, and as I did last week, uh, I do want to mention kind of where most of my information is coming from this week, and that's from this book called The Mystery of Joseph uh, by Father Marie Dominique Philippe. He was a, a French Dominican working in the, uh, the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. He just died in 2006. Uh, beautiful, beautiful man. He founded an order called uh, the Community of St. John. Uh, that's not to be confused with the Congregation of St. John, which is in trouble with Rome. But the community of St. John, very, very faithful order. Uh, and they actually have several houses here in the United States, but they're primarily a French order. Um, so you'll hear me refer to Father Philippe uh, a, no a number of times tonight. You'll see the reference uh, MOJ on some of the slides. That's just my abbreviation for the mystery of Joseph, this book. Okay. So, to begin with then, as I mentioned, one of the titles that, of, that Saint Joseph has is this title, The Silent Saint. Uh, and he's called The Silent Saint, right, because even though he's so important, here he is kind of, you know, one of the three people that make up the Holy Family at the very heart of the entire Christian mystery, you know? Even if we want to say he died when Joseph was still a young boy, he, or when Jesus was still a young boy, he still spent more time with our Lord than any of his apostles did. Okay, so this very, very central man uh, in our Lord's figures, or in our Lord's life, but we don't have any recorded words of St. Joseph. Not a single one uh, is recorded in Scripture. Uh, or in tradition. There are some uh, apocryphal Gospels, Gospels that aren't divinely inspired, that claim to have Joseph's words, but we don't have any of his words kind of concrete in front of us to look at. So he's, only, he's always been called this silent saint. The only things we know about him are kind of what God wants us to know. Uh, in the plan of salvation, for some mysterious reason, God has kind of put this veil, this shroud around Joseph. It's almost like he's claiming Joseph for his own, like he's claiming him for his own father. And so he kind of puts this shroud around Joseph. So we know some things, but we don't get to know him directly like our Lord did. So in order for us to, to kind of figure out you know, more about St. Joseph, uh, the way that I like to describe it is that we have to be like Sherlock Holmes, okay? We have, to, we have to learn through these kind of small details. There's Sherlock. Uh, we have to learn through, that's not St. Joseph. St. Joseph doesn't smoke a pipe. Uh, no, we have, to be, we have to be like Sherlock Holmes. We have to look at these uh, small little details, okay? And it may seem like we're making a, a lot out of them, right? But we have to be like Sherlock, look at all the small details to kind of put a picture together to see who this man was, to see how we're meant to understand him. So that's going to be kind of our method for this evening. That's how we're going to start out. All right. So to begin with, to actually jump into getting to know who this St. Joseph is, all right, it's important to note 
that St. Joseph kind of only appears in two of the four Gospels. He only appears in Luke and in Matthew. Uh, and the obvious reason for that is, is because Luke and Matthew have to deal with the infancy of our Lord. Yeah, so, because they have to deal with the infancy, they're obviously going to have to deal with Joseph, all right? But in particular, so that's kind of where we've got to start, Matthew and Luke. Uh, and both Matthew and Luke kind of emphasize, uh, well, Matthew and Luke are going to have two common themes, and then there, there's going to be this third that just Matthew has that's so important that we're really going to have to focus on. Uh, the first theme that's kind of important to Joseph is this idea of where he comes from, who his ancestors are. You know, remember Matthew, the, the first gospel writer, he's, he begins his whole gospel with the genealogy of Jesus, right? It's that, it's that reading you always feel bad for the priest or the deacon who gets that, you know, because there's so many names uh, in that reading of the gospel. But that's where Matthew starts out. And Matthew kind of starts out with that. Let's see what it says. Yeah, Matthew kind of starts out with that that uh, genealogy to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of promises that have come before him, namely the promises to Abraham and the promises to David. Okay, and those promises, the promise to Abraham in particular, was that. You know, or, or God said to him, I will make nations of you. Kings shall come forth from you. You know, so he's promising nations. He's promising this kingship. But then he gets even more specific and says that this kingship, these great kings will specifically come through the line of David. All right. And he promises to David, his full promise is, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Okay, so notice he's, he's referring to a singular person there. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Okay, so we see this promise of a king, this everlasting kingship who would rule forever, okay? And we know it doesn't refer to, to David's immediate sons or anything, because they die. They, you know, they're on the throne a brief time, and they die. All right? And indeed, by the time of Jesus, nobody even knows if this line of David still exists. I mean, they believe it does, but the line of David is no, no longer on the throne. But the important thing to note here with this promise, right, it was promised that it would be David's line on the throne. That David's line would be kings forever. Okay? Matthew and Luke both try to establish this with their genealogies. And obviously the step right before Jesus is Joseph. This is the first thing we kind of learn about Joseph. And that is that he is an heir of the line of David. And so he actually had a claim to the Israel throne. He would have had a legal right to be king over all of Israel. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, just, uh, it wasn't just something meant for Jesus, but it was something meant for all of David's line. And so he had a legal right to that. All right? But this is kind of the first thing we see about Joseph, what we know about Joseph, you know, is, oh, and I mean, in, in Luke, when he introduces, he specifically mentions this. He introduces Joseph as Joseph of the house of David. Okay, so again, he's emphasizing he's the heir to this promise. He's the heir, the inheritor of this kingship. Okay, but Joseph doesn't claim it. Joseph doesn't rise up and become king of Israel. Right? That's not where his, he's born. After the Babylonian captivity, the line of David has become hidden. It's become common. And instead of trying to rise up and kind of claim this, through humility, Joseph stays where God has placed him. He doesn't try to rise up and seize greatness for himself. He, he's a humble man. And, and in humility... You know, one of the key aspects of humility is kind of recognizing where God has placed us. You know, Joseph knew he was a carpenter. He lived in Nazareth. 
right? He knew he had this claim to the throne of Israel, but he stayed where he was because that's where God had put him. He didn't know why, but he knew that God had put him there for a reason. And of course, we all know why. <laughs> we all know what he becomes, what he does and everything, but he didn't. But out of his humility, he stays where he is. So that's kind of the first, first thing that we're told about Joseph in Scripture. And one of the first things that I want to emphasize about Joseph is that humility. By his birth, he, he was this great man. He could have been this political figure, this leader of a nation, right? But he stays where he is. He stays where he is, and he doesn't leave. And he stays because that's where God has put him. Okay? So... That's kind of the first aspect that I'd like to focus on. The second aspect is this description we find in Matthew of Joseph, the just man. Okay, When Matthew's beginning the, the narration story, the infancy story of his gospel, he emphasizes you know, that Joseph, or Joseph is a just man. When he introduces Joseph, he introduces him kind of in this context of, of Joseph discovering Mary's pregnancy, which is something we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, okay? But in introducing that, he introduces him as the just man. And this, this, this aspect of being a just man is a very, very important kind of description. It's not, you know, Matthew is not just using flowery words here. <laughs> You know, he's not going to waste his words. He's trying to be very concise. And he's trying to basically summarize all of Joseph in this aspect of a just man. And so the first kind of thing we need to understand about being a just man, okay, is, is it's someone who fulfills the law, right? There were all, you know, there were so many prescriptions of the old Jewish law. And indeed, in the Old Testament, that was the most basic understanding, was somebody who keeps the law, who fulfills all of those prescriptions, all right? It, the, a simple way to kind of phrase that, you know, to phrase that uh, justice is, is to give God what is owed. So the, sim, the simple way to do that is just to fulfill the commandments of the law. But that's the basic, basic, basic understanding. Okay? The Old Testament gives us a hint that to truly give God what he's owed is more than just to give him these external actions. It's more than just to obey the commandments. It's to commit our entire lives to God. And indeed, that's what we see when we get into, when we get into the Old Testament. And that's what Father Philippe describes here. Okay? He says, the truly just man of the Old Testament, far from being like the false just men, such as the Pharisees are, is someone who, like Abraham, lives by faith and fears the Lord. And this fear, far from being the terror evoked by a tyrant, is both the beginning of wisdom and its fullness. Okay, so note there, Father Philippe is saying this kind of basic understanding where we just kind of follow the commandments, that's what the Pharisees had. That's what they, they were trying to be just, man, just men, just through following the, the basic necessities of the commandments. To be truly just, though, to be in the full sense, is to be, like Habakkuk says, lives by faith. And indeed, that full quote that, that Father Philippe is quoting here is, Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail. But the righteous, which is the, it's the same word for just there, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So Habakkuk is identifying faith with the kind of centrality of being a just man, of being a righteous man. This is at the heart of the Jewish Old Testament understanding of justice. And so Matthew, who's writing for a Jewish audience, Right? is going to emphasize, or you know, when he uses this just man, he's, he's showing them that Joseph is primarily a man of faith. That that is the primary characteristic, or you know, that that's one of the primary characteristics of Joseph, is, is he's somebody who has faith. All right? And so that's going to be important to understand. I mean, as we go on, we're building slowly this picture of a, of a humble man, uh, of a man who 
who's filled with faith. But interestingly, where both Matthew and Luke agree, what's probably the most essential aspect of Joseph, what forms the very, very heart of his identity, is the fact that he is Mary's spouse. Both of them, both Matthew and Luke, don't talk about Joseph unless it's with Mary, unless it somehow has to deal with Mary. For both of them, they seem to see Joseph primarily as a man who is wrapped up and connected with his bride, the Virgin Mother. Okay, And indeed, this, this central aspect, you know, Father Philippe describes it so beautifully. After, after talking about Joseph, the humble worker, Father Philippe says, if, in, if Saint Joseph is indeed the meek, faithful, and poor servant, and thus the model of the Christian worker, he is even more the husband of Mary. He, he appears in Revelation as relative to Mary. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Okay, that last sentence there, that Jacob was the father of Joseph, that comes at the very end of Matthew's uh, genealogy. And in Matthew's genealogy, he kind of goes from beginning to end, right? And he says, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. He always uses this same format. X is the father of Y. Okay, he always uses this same format to kind of identify the central importance of that person in the link, right? But when he gets to Joseph, he changes. He doesn't say Joseph, who was called the father of Jesus, or anything like that. He identifies Joseph as the husband of Mary. Now, obviously, one of the reasons he's doing this is to avoid confusion. He doesn't want people to think that Joseph is actually the father of Jesus, right? Matthew wants them to recognize that this is a virgin birth. But on the other hand, I think that it is so striking that he uses the father of, the father of, the father of, and then suddenly goes to the husband of, that he's really emphasizing this fact that, that they are so close to one another. And indeed, one of you know, Luke kind of will do a very similar thing. Luke actually, you know, Matthew kind of introduces Joseph here, right, in this genealogy. Luke kind of introduces Joseph just as like a footnote to Mary, okay? In fact, Luke, you know, Luke kind of introduces it. He says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, there's that description we saw earlier, and the virgin's name was Mary. So in Luke's, in Luke's, go or in Luke's gospel, the, the kind of central thing is he wants to introduce Mary. He's, he's introducing the angel Gabriel is coming to this virgin Mary, right? And then as a footnote to that, he introduces Joseph. And so in Luke's mind, too, the mystery of Joseph, of who this man Joseph was, is all wrapped up in, in, this, in this person of Mary. And indeed, I couldn't, I couldn't help but think as I was preparing for this, you know, I mean, one of the most beautiful aspects is we always have to remember the Gospels didn't just plop down in front of us, right? They, they had to be written by men. <laughs> they were written by men for men. And, and so when Matthew and Luke tell us all these stories, they had to get them from somewhere, right? They didn't, they didn't, most of, you know, we kind of sometimes have this picture of the Gospels were written with just this person sitting in a room and God just speaking to them, right? But indeed, they, they're so filled with personality, you know, there is a tradition that both Matthew and Luke got so many, of, much of their infancy narrative from Mary, from the only person who would have known about those incidents, about the Magi, about the Annunciation. She's the only one who knows. So they're, they're getting their information from her. So when we hear these descriptions of Saint Joseph, we have to recognize that in some sense they are the descriptions of Mary to us about her husband, 
about her husband, about she's giving us an insight into their marriage, into their love for one another in these words, okay? And so that's something to keep in mind as we go on. All right, so those three essential aspects of, of St. Joseph are, first is humility, that refusal to become king, that, that idea he had a, 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 you know, a, a rightful claim to the throne. All right, so two, he was that just man, a man of faith. I mean, again, that's, that's a phrase that, you know, I mean, I imagine came, I mean, I can't, I can't say this for sure, but I imagine it came from Mary herself. I don't think a writer would have just thrown that in unless he had picked that up from the storyteller. All right, and then number three, that husband of Mary, all wrapped up in that marriage with, with our, our, you know, our blessed mother, okay? So those are gonna be the three kind of guiding lights. We're gonna to try to keep this man we've created, this humble, this faith-filled man, this man who's totally in love with the Virgin Mary, kind of in front of us as, it go, as we go along, so that we can understand exactly why he does things that he does, okay? So what I'd like to pose for you tonight when it comes to St. Joseph's faith is that St. Joseph primarily had faith in God. His faith was always founded in God. But in some sense, Mary is the way in which God works in his life. Many of the time, you know, he's so wrapped up, his vocation is so wrapped up in Mary that he will have his faith will be founded in God, but he also has incredibly, incredible faith in Mary herself. He always trusts her. He always believes her and puts his trust in her, okay? So that's going to be, like I said, we're building towards kind of where we're, you know, where we're going with these, these two events that show his faith, okay? And the first event, the first event I want to talk about is one that's not actually found in Scripture, okay? It's, it's one that we know happened, we can be certain it happened, but nowhere is it actually described for us. All right, and that is the betrothal of Mary and Joseph. Okay, we know, first time we meet Joseph, first time we meet Mary, they're already betrothed. So we know that there was this event that happened in, this pa in, the, in their past, this courtship and this betrothal that, that you know, kind of forms the center of their relationship. All right, and the, that's what, yeah, not mentioned in scripture, but we know it must have happened. All right. And indeed, you know, Father Philippe kind of describes this beautiful moment, this, this first, the first even beginning of their, their courtship, and I thought I'd share that with you. He says, It must have been a very great moment for the heart of this just and upright, God-fearing, God-loving man, when he first met Mary and discovered her as the little creature that God had placed upon his path. Joseph's joy was this. Discovering this little creature of such simplicity, so hidden away, your eyes are doves behind your veil, and receiving the smile that revealed her yes. I mean, Joseph and Mary, we can only imagine two, two such holy people, they learned, you know, they, they, they were, their entire lives were wrapped up in love. And so when these two people came together, when they met each other for the first time, what incredible love there must have, have been between each other, okay? But this love has a very specific characteristic. This love is, is a very unique characteristic. It's not the same type of love that a, that a man and woman always have for each other. And that's because this love was primarily kind of wrapped up in the mystery of Mary's consecration to God. You know, we know from, from tradition, right, that Mary at a very young age, at the age, you know, some people say at the age of seven or so, right, at the very dawn of reason, she consecrated her whole virginity to God. And we're going we're to talk more about that next week, okay? But we also kind of have hints about this in Scripture, right? I mean, when, when we come to the Annunciation, we'll see Mary is going to ask the question, how can this be since I know not man? You know, it hints at this, this deeper consecration, this vow of virginity that she has taken earlier in her life. And that vow 
is something that, that has to shape Joseph and Mary's love for each other. I mean, they're a man and a woman. If one of them has vowed virginity, that's going to have a profound effect on that relationship, right? Okay, and so it has such a profound effect that we have to say, before they got betrothed, or you know, before they became betrothed, Mary had to have told Joseph before that commitment was made. You know, I, you know, there's no, I can't imagine, you know, the Blessed Mother going through the betrothal and, and, and having this commitment and then going to Joseph afterwards and being by, like, oh, by the way, <laughs> I don't know if you realize this, but you just married somebody who promised her virginity to Christ. No, I don't think that would happen. I think, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious. It, it kind of love and truthfulness demands that she would have told Joseph about this most special, this most sacred aspect of her life, okay? And, and the way Father Philippe puts it uh, is Mary inevitably confided her great secret to Joseph, the secret of her consecration to God. She could not have done otherwise. She was obliged to do so in order to be truthful since she was totally consecrated to God. And if she had not confided it to him, there would have been some sort of lie between them. It wouldn't have been a real relationship if they had not been honest with something as, as simple as that. Okay? So in this betrothal then, we know that Mary's told him, right? And yet Joseph go ahead, goes ahead with the betrothal. He goes ahead and commits himself to Mary. All right? And so in the betrothal, we can see something else about Joseph. In choosing Mary... He chooses to completely dedicate his life to God. He chooses to make the same promise now. He would not have gotten married to, to our, our blessed mother and expected that promise to somehow go away. He would have, would have, you know, that decision to go forward with the betrothal, that decision in Joseph's mind is a consecration of virginity. It is his own vow of virginity to God now. And so we see there kind of an aspect of, of Joseph's faith, you know, that's all-encompassing. Remember, we said faith is all-encompassing. Well, it's encompassing all of Joseph's life now. It's, it's entering into the very heart of his marriage, right? But he had to, he had to trust, he had to have faith in both, in both Mary and in God, because what, a, what an incredible concept, right? What an incredible concept that two people could be married and not fulfill that through conjugal love, not fulfill that through the sexual act, but instead be married as virgins, consecrated to God. I mean, what a radical idea, something totally new. And so Joseph, first off, has to have faith in Mary. She's the one that made the promise first. She's the one that's made this vow of virginity. If she's going forward with it, he has to trust her, has to trust that she knows she's not breaking her promise, right? He has to, so his faith is founded in Mary, but it's founded in God as well. He's got to, he has to believe that God somehow means for this marriage to happen. That God, that God means this for their lives together. You know, it's not, this isn't just something that's being done with just two humans coming together. Joseph would have totally trusted God. I mean, Father Philippe says, Joseph, by loving Mary and choosing her, gives himself totally to God, gives his trust, his, his entire belief, his entire faith to our Father in Heaven. Okay, and so this is the kind of first aspect where we see where Joseph has this kind of twofold faith, right? He has this twofold faith and he believes that Mary knows what she's doing. And at the same time, he believes that God knows what he's doing in leading these two people together. All right? So we see him acting this double, this double act of faith out. But then where we're really going to see that, you know, where we're really going to see Joseph's kind of concrete act of faith, okay, is in the Annunciation and in his reaction to the Annunciation, such a mysterious reaction, okay? We'll see that, that this is where, in some sense, his faith is going to, to blossom into its fullest, okay? 
So, in the enunciation, a few things to note as we go along here. First off, you know, it is traditional to say that the angel Gabriel seems to come to Mary when she is alone. So Joseph is not there. Okay? Sometimes, I have seen some paintings where the artist will, will depict the angel speaking directly to Mary, and Joseph is like kind of in the background listening. But it's much more common, and I think it's the much more universal tradition of the church, that Mary was alone. Okay, many, most of the paintings of the Annunciation depict this, this event between Mary and Gabriel as something that takes place one-on-one, -on -one, as something that, that takes place privately. All right, and scripture kind of backs that up. Right? I mean, Luke, Luke says that, that Gabriel came to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph, yes, but came only to her, not necessarily to Joseph. You know, it, said, it says, and he came to her, to Mary, and said, and that's where it goes into the Annunciation. So it is, this, this Annunciation is this very private act. You know, it, it doesn't involve Joseph. It's something directly between God and Mary through this angel Gabriel, right? And the question then becomes, if Joseph and Mary were betrothed, if they were going to, to want to be married, why wouldn't God have Joseph there? Why not just explain it to both of them? Why does he have to explain it only to Mary and kind of leave Joseph out in the cold, right? But this event, this, this event of the Annunciation, this private Annunciation, is not something that's kind of a, a, a slam on Joseph, as it were. It's not, some, it's not an insult to Joseph. As much as it is a, a compliment and a kind of loving action to Mary, in the Annunciation, God is doing something so incredibly personal with Mary, forming her in such a personal way. This is why she was made, to make this choice that it has to be something personal. It has to be something secret. It has to be something kept in between the two of them. Okay? It, why, when we ask this question, why not include Joseph? The way Father Philippe puts it, this is a long one, is he says, it is so that we understand that Mary's covenant with her God is a personal covenant and is greater than any human friendship. She is consecrated to God, and through her motherhood, she will be consecrated in a new way, in a new way that is yet more profound and more divine. There is, as it were, a double consecration, a legit eum et pre legit eum, as the Latin liturgy used to say for the office of virgins. He chose her and preferred her. In this way, he chose her twice, in the mystery of her consecration and in the mystery of her maternal consecration. Okay, so it's, the, the Annunciation then is this mystery that expresses kind of the, the intimacy and union between God and Mary. So we can't confuse that and say, okay, Joseph is left out in the cold. No, it's something where God is showing his preference for Mary, his, his love for Mary. It's not in any way any type of sentence on Joseph. All right? But it brings about with it a new cross, kind of a new, a new sacrifice, as it were, okay? It brings about this, this intense suffering because Mary suddenly has something. She knows something. She has this secret, right? And she's been entrusted by, the, by God with this secret. This is such an intimate and personal union with God that Mary knows that she just can't go and tell Joseph about it on her own. Right? This is God's secret that, you know, God's very secret, this son of God that's been given to her. So she can't just go out and tell anybody. This is something that God is going to tell people when he wants to tell them. And so this is, a new, this is an intense cross for Joseph. He, he loves this woman, and suddenly there's something that, that she won't tell him. And indeed, there's the, you know, we have the Annunciation, and then, you know, we're told that immediately she leaves for her cousin Elizabeth's. Right, who's six months pregnant, and she stays there through the birth of John the Baptist. So she stays there for three months. So Joseph has this kind of double suffering of you have this you have Mary being silent about something, 
You have, she's gone for three months, so he doesn't know where she's gone. He doesn't know, or I mean, he probably knew where she went. But I mean, you know, he misses her. He wants her back. And then suddenly she's come back, she comes back, and she's expecting. Okay, and this is kind of the pinnacle moment in Joseph's life. This is kind of where everything is going to come together and where, where we're going to see his, his act of faith in its fullest. And indeed, this act of faith takes on a very mysterious form for us. Matthew says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. What a mysterious action, an action that really takes a lot to kind of wrap our mind around. Joseph discovers Mary's pregnant and decides to divorce her. Decides to send her away quietly. Not, not to you know, put her through any public shame or anything, but still to divorce her, to send her away. You know, on the surface level, on the surface interpretation of this, you know, and oftentimes what I've, what I've heard a number of times is there's this kind of temptation to think that he's sending her away because he thinks that Mary has been unfaithful. That he thinks that Mary has cheated on him. And that he's sending her away to be in accord with the Jewish law, but he's doing it quietly because he loves her. Well, I just don't, I mean, everything that we've talked about up until this point, him being a man of humility, a man of faith, and a man devoted to Mary, that doesn't sound like the Joseph that we know, that, that he would divorce Mary in this way. So what is he thinking? Where, where is he going? Why is he doing this? The hint there is in that phrase, again, just man. Notice this is where Matthew introduces it. He introduces it in the context of this divorce that Joseph is planning. Okay? And so the first thing that we have to kind of note is if he's a just man, then he's a man of faith. Right? And one of the things that we can note is that he never would have lost faith in Mary. Okay? So that's our surface interpretation. He never loses his faith in his bride. He, he kind of, he holds tightly to her, all right? That this tradition, this kind of, this idea that Joseph never doubted her purity, that never doubted her kind of faithfulness to him, is something that we see in, in the saints, specifically in St. Jerome. St. Jerome's the first one to tell us this. He says that this testimony is Mary's, this whole story is Mary's testimony to us. That Joseph, knowing her chastity and marveling at what had happened, kept secret the mystery of which he was ignorant. He knew of her promise. He knew of her consecration to our Lord, her virginal consecration. And he, he trusted that. And so he knew that she had become pregnant in some other way. That something very mysterious had happened. And he decided to remain quiet about this. All right? But... The person who I think explains it best kind of follows up and borrows from Jerome and develops it and expounds it, and that is St. Thomas Aquinas. In, in St. Thomas Aquinas' commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, he has this big paragraph to give us. and I mean, it's so perfect. It summarizes it so perfect what's going on that, that I'm just going to read it. According to Jerome and Origen, Joseph had no suspicion of adultery, because he knew the modesty and chastity of Mary. Moreover, he had read in Scripture that the virgin would conceive, and that a shoot shall sprout from the stock of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. He knew also that Mary was descended from the line of David. Thus, it was easier for him to believe that Isaiah's prophecy had been accomplished in her than to think that she could have let herself descend into debauchery. This is why, considering himself unworthy to live with a person of such great sanctity, he wanted to send her away again secretly. Like when Peter says to Jesus, Depart from me, Lord, 
for I am a sinful man. Doesn't this fit more with what we've seen? Doesn't this fit more with the description of Joseph as a just man, Joseph as a humble man, right? Suddenly it makes sense as a man of faith. It makes sense to us, okay? He had such great faith in, in Mary's purity that the first thing that comes to mind to Joseph when he sees Mary pregnant is Isaiah's scripture. The virgin shall conceive a son. Does it even cross his mind to think that Mary might have cheated on him? <laughs> Rather, it's easier for him to think of this scripture verse than to jump to that conclusion that Mary had somehow committed adultery, that she had broken her promise of virginity to God, or anything like that. This was much, much easier for Joseph to understand. Okay? And indeed, you know, the... The response that he has then is he sees this. He understands this promise that this virgin shall conceive a son. He understands that that is directly related to the Messiah, to the promise of the king who is coming, who will rule forever. And Joseph, in his humility, in his lowliness, looks at that and responds and says, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to have her in my home. I can't do this. I can't guide her as she needs to be guided, okay? So the way that, that Father Philippe describes it is he says Joseph believes he would not have the necessary prudence to be the guardian of her whom God had chosen. Being a worker, he does not have the refinement needed, so the only thing to do is to step aside. There is something very great indeed about Joseph's kenosis, self-emptying or self-sacrifice. It is hard for him having had the happiness of knowing Mary, to see, that he, to see that he should quietly step back, understanding that this is the right thing to do. God has all the rights over Mary. This is what the just man does. He recognizes that God has all the rights. In Joseph's mind then, he sees this enunciation. He sees the virgin bear a son. He knows the beautiful good news that it brings. But he also knows, and he believes, or at least he thinks, that what God has done is he's placing a special claim on Mary. He's, God is, is kind of claiming Mary for himself. You know? And so there's no way that Joseph could make a claim to Mary as well. There's no way that he could say, no, 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 I have rights over what, our Lord, what God has rights over. No, so he steps back and says, okay, God, if you want her all to yourself, if you want her totally for your bride to be your mother, I'll step back. I'll let you have her. Okay, this is Joseph. I mean, talk about what an incredible sacrifice. We've talked about how much they loved each other. But Joseph is willing to do this because of his faith in God. He, he again believes this must be in God's plan. This must be what happens. And so... This, this kind of incredible faith of Joseph, I mean, you know, how many of us seeing a, a, an unwed woman pregnant would have so much faith in her to believe that God had somehow miraculously conceived a son in her? <laughs> I mean, he has such incredible faith. This is why he's chosen to be, to be the father of our Lord. This is why he's chosen to be the spouse of our, of our blessed mother. Okay? And so... So, you know, and, and, he, and this is confirmed to him. And this is, this is the, the hidden meaning there of, of the angel's blessing. The angel, you know, oftentimes when we, when we, you know, see this quote here from the angel, this is the angel speaking to, to Joseph. When we see this quote, a lot of times we, say, we think to ourselves and we say, you know, okay, well, he's assuring her of her chastity. Right? No, he's not assuring her of her chastity so much as he's promising that Joseph will be a part of this. Because he says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call you, notice that, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the angel has been sent here. To, to tell Joseph two things. One, first, notice that part I underlined. Your wife. 
He's come to, to tell Joseph, no, nope, God has made this claim over Mary. She ha he has indeed claimed Mary for his own, but he's also giving her to you. He's also letting her be your wife. He's, the angel is confirming to Joseph that it is God's will that Mary be his wife. He need not be afraid. You know, this is why the angel doesn't, doesn't have any words of rebuke for Joseph. He doesn't come to correct Joseph. All he says is, do not fear. Okay? But then he also goes a step further. to something that Joseph couldn't have even hoped for in his wildest dreams. And that is, you shall call his name Jesus. He's giving Joseph here, and through, through his angel, God is giving Joseph here, not just Mary, but Jesus. He's giving Joseph the authority over Jesus. He's giving Joseph the ability to give Jesus his name. Okay, and what a profound gift. What a wonderful, you know, you know God can never be matched with, gener matched with generosity, right? He's, his generosity always goes so far beyond ours. And Joseph here is, has, has given his faith, has totally believed in Mary, in the power of God to do this. And, and all that he wants in his heart, all that he's thinking is he wants to do God's will, but he also is desperately you know, he's in love with this woman. And so God gives him both Mary, but then goes a step further and gives him his son. This is a, this is a presence of Jesus born out of faith. You know, that Joseph's faith is what brings him into this relationship. It's what makes him head of the family. It's what makes him the person that God gives Jesus to. And so when I look at Joseph, when I think about this Advent and the year of faith and everything, I think about you know how much more we should be faithful, how, a strong, how we should be focusing on believing more in the power of God. So then when we, when we see something happen, the first thing we think of is, how is God working here? Not how is it likely that I that this might have happened, but how is God working here? And so I see this Advent for us, especially here in Sacred Heart, you know, as a time where we can truly come to believe, to, to grasp onto the faith more and more strongly. And if we do that, we will receive the same reward Joseph is. And that is that at Christmas, Jesus will come to dwell with us, to be in, in our household. That's, that's the great reward that's promised to us through this example of, of Joseph, the man of faith. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit,